morning, Reg Castees. I bring you the shocking news this morning that Windows can't be everything to everyone. At least that's what our panel today thinks. We've done a lot of RegCasts about Windows, Windows 7, how you migrate to it, how you use it, how you make the best of it. Well, it's desktop Linux's time. And uh, so we've got the guys who are going to explain whether that is something you should be considering. I assume that you are considering it. Otherwise, you've come to the wrong RegCast. Don't go if you haven't. It, it, it's going to be terrific. Let me explain a little bit about the interface to you, uh, to newbies. Um, there, you can get a copy of your slides if you want. You can, um, uh, but the most important thing is that you give us your questions. We, if there's something on your mind, if you've got a question, then please type it in, send it to us. I see it on my screen. I read it out to the guys. If they don't answer it, then I nag them to answer it. If we don't get all the questions in, then they'll answer them afterwards for you. It's a terrific service. It's all free. Please make use of it. And don't complain afterwards if we don't cover the things that are on your mind if you haven't asked the question. Give us your feedback afterwards as well. But that's for afterwards. Let's do the RegCast first. So let's see who's on our RegCast today. And uh, so we have Canonical with us today for the first time in the studio. They're very welcome. And Mr. Business for Canonical's Paul Holt. Paul, welcome to the studio. Morning, Tim. Your, your job title isn't really Mr. Business, is it? No, uh, but essentially I, I, I you know, put the commercial uh, business around essentially what is free software. So I have the challenge of essentially selling free software. Yeah. Yes, good. good. Uh, it's Mr. Business is just a silly joke that I made up. Um, I, I, I would also point out to uh, all our viewers today, that um, Paul arrived on one of those little tiny fold-up bikes. And it's terrific. I, I just point out to you, when Microsoft come here, they come in taxis. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I actually, when IBM come, they come in a huge stretch limo. It's, yeah, it's terrific. But, uh, but, uh, you know, but it's an efficient choice. So, yeah, so good. And also, with Paul today's Canonicals, Mr. Tech, Boris Duvouge. Hello, Tim. Hello. Uh, you, now, don't ramp up the French accent now, just because uh, just because we're broadcasting. I, I'm very sorry, I'm French, and I, I will repeat anything I, I have to no say. If my accent. To <laughs> You're Mr. Tech here. Uh, yeah, or pause up Mr. Tech for the Regcast. Uh, essentially, what I do is I back up Paul's commercial argument with good, solid explanation to our customers when it comes to the technical stand, technical well, we, point. We're going to be needing you in the next hour, then, in that case. Or... Um, I believe, yeah, I have a fair bit of a few things to point out. Yes, right. um, I'd like to point out as well that I came this morning using the tube. Well, that's, uh, that's fair enough. I, you know, I mean, I make no criticism. I make no value <laughs> judgment on you know, methods of transport. I, it, I just, you know, I, it just amused me. Um, and uh, also for uh, our old mate Freeform Dynamics, I'm calling you Mr. Pie Chart today. He's one of us. It's Andy Vuss. Hi, Tim. Hello, Good to Andy. be back. Are those new glasses you're wearing today? Um, well, they're pretty old, uh, but my contact lenses were not great to wear this morning, so... I've got my old glasses back on. A little slice of life personal detail for you. My name's Tim Phillips, as you know, and I am apparently today the Reg's Mr Bean. And what are we discussing today? It's the how, the why, and the when. So I did that backwards. The when, why, and the how of desktop Linux. What we hope to do in the next hour is, for uh, any of you who thought about desktop Linux, don't really know whether you should be getting involved with it, we're going to tell you what that's going to involve, where you should be targeting it, how much work you're going to have to do to get it in your organisation, and whether or not you can expect it to be a success or a horrible disaster. I've got a feeling with the guys in the studio today, we're probably not going to come down on the side of a horrible disaster. It would be a surprising regcast if we did. But you never know. Anything could happen in the next 60 minutes. So, guys, first of all, um, uh, Andy, let's have a look at the uh, current desktop Linux show. This is why we've got Canonical here, because they are the custodians of Ubuntu, aren't they? But your diagram seems to me to suggest that Ubuntu has 25% of 100%, plus about another 35% of it. What does this mean? Well, what we're really looking at here is where companies have deployed desktop Linux, how widely they've deployed it throughout their organization. So really, it's a matter of uh, which distributions are tending to have the most um, penetration into the company once they've been put in place. And we can gauge this as a measure of successes to the overall objective. So here, for example, we can see 25% of the reg readers that deployed Ubuntu were deploying it on a, about 100% of their, their PCs. Ah. Example. So in this right. case, they're using it very successfully because it's very widespread throughout the organization. That seems like a very high number to me. It does, but remember, this is the reg readership that we're talking about often, forward thinking and uh, doing things. But it gives us a good idea in the different flavors of Linux as to which are the most successful in an enterprise desktop environment. 
Okay, is this uh, similar to what you guys see for market share? I mean, certainly from a uh, from a desktop perspective, Ubuntu, no question, is, is the strongest distribution that, 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 that's out there. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly surprised that the numbers are so high, but there again, the Reg users are an educated bunch and probably can you know see the value of running uh, Linux on on a desktop. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I say, you know, certainly with on the desktop in the in the corporate world, if, if you're going to deploy it onto the desktop, Ubuntu generally is the distribution of choice. Well, it's, you know, relax. If the numbers are too, just relax into it. This is yeah, kind of I'm not going to fight them. Um, <laughs> Or, but, uh, I mean, surely, you know, basically all desktop Linux is more or less the same. Boris? Um, no, I'd like to disagree on this. I think what Ubuntu has done for the last uh, seven years is really target the user base into a very easy, a very mainstream area of the operating system and the desktop itself. So um, I'm, I am as well kind of surprised with the number, considering the, the register leadership, uh, I agree that they will match, actually, the expectation of the people there. Um, but at the same time, I think it is it is a... A, a, a completely right reward of the work that we've been doing into making really Unix, Linux desktop much more easier to use, much more mainstream, much more easier and available for all kind of targets. So obviously that's what makes it, I will think, I will think a prime proponent into corporation and enterprises. Andy, are, you, are your statistics wrong here? Well, we've got to realise that the sample here is an online sample and, and self-selecting. Self-selecting, so what, what we that's were it, after isn't it? Yeah. was people who've got experience of using Linux. Got it. So that is a proportion of the market already. So this is showing of those people who've got experience how widely they tend to use it. So it will be, it's not exact market share numbers, mm. but it's just an indication of how widely deployed the different Linuxes are, where they're actually in use. What, it's, what I'm concerned about is it means that we've probably got the right people in the studio. Well, we'll see. <laughs> now it's uh, this is the uh, this is the the when and um, Andy what this shows us is a lot of people considering the up, uh, uh, an upgrade at the moment. We've talked an awful lot about VDI over the last year uh, on many regcasts. Um, bubbling under that as the alternative issue you're replacing Windows is Linux. Absolutely, and what we've got to realise <coughs> is what we're not trying to do is throw Windows out completely. For many, that won't really be the right business or user solution, but it's about choosing the right application environment, the right experience for groups of users within the organization, and realizing that Windows, for everyone, may be, it may be suitable for most of the business. For some, it may be suitable for all the business. But in many other cases, it may be cheaper, more easy to deploy, more supportable. If you look at an alternative, one of those is, say, virtual desktop infrastructure, but that has challenges such as what do you do when you're on and offline, um, how do you do it when um, you're using equipment outside of the, the corporation, can you access your virtual desktop from untrusted machines or not. Um, so another option to take is if you're using old equipment or maybe looking at spe specific apps for certain roles, is to actually look at an optimized desktop that maybe not, is not Windows. I mean, Andy, and Andy makes some good points there. If you look at VDI, and many of the reasons why people look at VDI, it's about security, it's about a light, des light desktop, it's about low cost, and all of those actually can also be uh, all of those questions can also be answered very well with a, with, a, with a Linux desktop. So, you know, VDI, whilst Linux sits very nicely within a, in a, within a VDI environment, a Linux desktop can also be an alternative to a VDI uh, type environment. So you have that discussion with potential customers. The we might be going to we might be going to VDI or we might be going to Linux. Is this a choice for, for exactly those types of reasons? I mean, customers aren't necessarily perhaps looking to deploy a VDI environment. What they're looking for is to deploy something which is more lightweight, which is secure, something which they can manage very very easily. So VDI is one solution, but also a solution is, is a Linux desktop. It answers many of the same questions. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will tend to absolutely agree. I think a lot of people are looking at VDI, but the, the number of implementation actually are very, very low. So it is actually a good conduct to start to, to analyze the cost on the traditional desktop infrastructure and, and realize where can we cut those costs. But exactly as it's been, as it's been pointed out, the thing like offline, the thing like management, security, taking work at home, all those points are making it a bit impractical nowadays in today's circumstances. So this is where, again, something that is built on target Gets built for purpose, just enough desktop operating system within the Linux client can completely address that as well. Yeah, you're beating the uh, the Apple Mac notebooks and desktops. Are always a little bit disappointing for you and me, Andy, as Mac users. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's again. It, it, 
Is it sort of, is, is this the, the, the old school? Sandy said, you know, we're not trying to get rid of Windows on the desktop. Is this, um, uh, you know, do you now live in a world where you accept that there will be different types of desktop in different areas and you're just trying to grab a little bit here and there? I mean, I think the, the question becomes fit for purpose. Uh, and organizations now are increasingly saying, OK, so what operating system works for what segment of my work, work, workforce? Uh, and, and Mac is obviously one of those, one of those solutions, and we're certainly uh, not out there to you know, displace uh, all operating systems. I think the message is, is that Linux has a very, very strong message now with respect to where, where it can work within organizations and companies and answer lots of the questions where perhaps Mac and Windows can't. We're, all, we're already getting the questions, which is the, the stuff that popped into my head as well, about how when you have multiple OSs in the organization, how you're going to manage that and the sort of management software that's best to use with Linux. So hold on to that because we've got the questions about it. We won't answer them just yet because it will spoil the surprise. But, there, you know, I, but I, I will be asking you about that later because it is very relevant, Absolutely. isn't it? And it's been very, uh, one of the selling points of uh, VDI has been a sort of a continuity of, you know, of what people will see. They won't right. even... In the best case, they don't really even know that it's gone to it's gone to VDI from the desktop. You can't supply that at the moment, so you're selling more on the uh, on what you consider to be the technical benefits. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the question is an interesting question, and uh, you know, whilst perhaps not answering it just yet, you know, one of the challenges that companies face actually is also how do we create an infrastructure which can accept these multiple operating systems? You know, in terms of authentication, all the, all those types of things. Mm. It's it's a very real real challenge. Yeah. Nothing, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> because what do we want from the desktop? What do we want from desktop Linux? Well, this is it's another one that I find a little bit surprising here, Andy Buzz. The huge amount of people wanting usability. Is that because the perception is that it's not very usable? That's definitely been true in the past. And uh, what we're looking for really is a, a solution that fits with the way people need to work. And this is not just IT staff that are comfortable with Linux, for example. It's day-to-day -day users. People who at home will probably be running Windows if they've got a computer, maybe running the Mac because it's more popular in the, uh, in, the, in the home than it is in business, for example. Might but be. it's about making sure that it's fit for purpose and that the experience is good, it's intuitive, and it works. So usability is key because at the end of the day, it's the users of the business who need to be using the Linux solution that's rolled out and if they're unhappy with it it can lead to a project that is rejected that fails that doesn't take into account their needs and is actually it's then has a negative impact on the business usability boris has been your has been a problem for desktop linux for a long time now is that getting sorted out so i do think i do agree it has been a problem and the perception still subsides the, the, the problem is something that happened five years ago is still carrying on nowadays i think part with the work that ubuntu has done on usability we find now environment that are completely i would say common line free where people will just simply point and click interfaces exactly the same way as they'll do it on on concurrent or legacy operating system what we find as well is that the the, the cutting point is really on cost and when we realize the cost of those current infrastructure and what we can have something good enough for less price targeted built on purpose but partly contained and controlled which address of course the the, the, the second port the second highest chart there mm. and it's really where people are going it's really what Linux is nowadays so I think the perception should be changed the point I wanted to add as well is that Mac at the at the end of the day is not really the end solution because Ubuntu for example runs perfect perfectly well on Mac hardware so even if initially people go to Mac towards the to Mac towards the, the nice hardware the usability and the feasibility it is completely possible to run to run out again Again, a thin client, a f very mm. light client, based on Linux on top of that Mac hardware. So in itself, it is not addressing the finality of the solution, but more the cost, I would say, is the driver. I would Perhaps, uh, just, just to address the usability question, in terms of, you know, from somebody who's been in the Linux world for 10 years, as a non-techie, um, between what we were even just a few years ago in terms of the actual usability, it, it, it is so, so rich now in terms of the usable experience. It's, it's very intuitive. You know, you can take a non-Windows, so you can take a Windows user and put them in front of a, an Ubuntu desktop and very, very quickly see but that. Is, no is, your, is it like what Boris said, you, you're looking for good enough usability at a more competitive price point, or do you think you can match Windows for usability? The question becomes fit for purpose. Um, you know, what usability, what's the user experience that I actually want 
this particular person to have with their desktop environment. Uh, and one of the great things about uh, Linux, of course, is that you can change that. You can change that user experience. You know, it's, it, it's no secret that there are a number of different user interfaces that you can put on top of your distribution mm -hmm. of choice. You know, Ubuntu has two at the moment which are quite different uh, in terms of GNOME and um, also one called Unity, but there's KDE and there's other, you know, there's other choices out there. So you can very much, you know, as, as Boris says, you can make it fit for purpose. You can tailor make that user experience, and that I think is one of the real advantages over the other distribution, over the other operating systems, which are. Uh but um, just a last point, it's worth addressing as well that the, the, the way we input and the way we interact with computers have changed as well. So, for example, with touch coming pretty much into the focus of all, every, every new device we have, I mean, these are areas, for example, where we can have a little bit of advance because we can start developing early for these, those touches interface. We can start to have um, desktop that are actually taking the best out of the point and click interface and mixing it with the touch interface to offer that nice transition um, effectively. The last point on usability is sure there is area where we will need to catch up compared to a Windows environment, and those are very well known out there. But there's other areas as well where Linux is actually leading. And I will point, for example, things such as 3G integration, tiffering out of a 3G phone to get wireless absolutely everywhere you are. Um, those kind of things are actually much more secure, supported, and easy to integrate on Linux. It takes actually three clicks to connect to your mobile phone and to be over 3G with a Linux laptop. Windows will require a lot of installation of software and etc., making sure we have the right card and etc. So in Aria, yes, we have to catch up on usability. In others, we are actually leading it. It's a different sort of usability you're talking Correct. about there, isn't it? One that perhaps is more um, that uh, a, a technical uh, audience could sort of like say, "Aha! I understand what sure. I understand what he's getting at with that." And the user say, "I don't care as long as it just works." True. And so to actually, let's get into that a little bit because if we're looking at the the types of users for desktop Linux. You've already said it's not something that you think, um, Paul, that should be, is just a blanket operating system for everyone in the organization at the moment. It can be, but I think the most important thing is that an organization actually goes through the, through the, the process and asks themselves the question. Essentially, say, you know, what is the experience that I want these people to have within the organization? And in certain organizations, we've worked with a number of companies who have made that decision that Linux will be the default desktop throughout the entire organization. Uh, there's a question, actually, Donald's. Uh, there's, no, Dave's been uh, asking that. Um, are, are, are there some rollouts that you would mention, some of the vendors? Um, so, uh, actually, only last week uh, we did a press release about an organization which had 12,000 desktops uh, rolled out, and um, this is a, a very, very large insurance company which is called LVM. Mm -hmm. uh, their entire infrastructure is, is essentially based on Linux, on, on Ubuntu. Everybody from the CEO down to I mean, call centers. Yeah. There are a few Windows machines in there. I would mislead you if, if you know, there are very few organizations that don't have uh, Windows machines in them, um, but you know LVM is a very interesting organisation in in that uh, you know they have remote um, people in the field. They have many many salespeople out there. These are guys who are essentially running Ubuntu, and the whole company's infrastructure is is, is depending on Linux as as a, as a desktop. Mm -hmm. And to be frank, to most people in the company, they don't even know that it's Linux or uh, don't really care that it's Linux which is running running the business. But there are certainly lots of organisations now who are looking at quite large scale implementations. Mm -hmm. So I will back up this and say actually, uh, uh, yes, and if to bring a bit of technical detail into this, it's really, uh, again, integration. Those people are very remote with those 12,000 desktops, so they have to rely on 3G network. They have to uh, rely on wireless. They're absolutely not technical, so this, this so needs to be taken Actually, what you were just saying is one of the reasons <coughs> Absolutely correct. I mean, if you look at other things such as smart card login, integration into asset management of the company, into legacy software as well of the company, all that work, again, is possible because we, we're dealing with something that is flexible, Built, for ta built on target for purpose, really on requirements that are given to us. So people shouldn't try uh, uh, Ubuntu as it is off the CD of the download and thinking this is what I'm going to run. No, we're talking about something that is much more trimmed down, that is really adapted to their process, that is built e especially for their process and the user base we're targeting. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the applications that they're running, what did they do in, 
in terms of running either from SAS or getting the, the critical applications running on the, the uh, Ubuntu? Exactly. So this has been made possible for, for, for two, we, we think two different streams. First, we think a stream of people starting to develop mainly on SaaS. So, of course, you need to put just a browser out there, a secure browser platform. That's all you need to actually use the application and interact on, on your everyday work. The second thing is we're seeing as well people starting to be involved with the community and developing actually the application with, I would say, generic framework, framework that do work on every single platform. So just they understand Java is an example of a toolkit, for example, where we're going to have a development and then it doesn't really matter the underlying platform. We'll make sure that the application development is validated and we can still carry on on running it rather than picking a proprietary, you know, assigned to an operating system toolkit from the start. You think in the short term, it's a less intensive way to uh, migrate in the short term is to go for that SaaS route rather than to do any redevelopment. Do you see that one as going to be a, a something that's going to help your growth? So not only is it going to help our growth, but I think we, we're just seeing it out there without us having to request it. If you look at SIs or many of the, of the, of the, of the very tailored development done for, for, for enterprise, that have been to move from that legacy platform and bring it into a SaaS model. So this is already reported to us from the SIs, from the channels, from the groups that are effectively doing it for enterprises. And the first step will be, of course, a secure browser out there. And then we're looking at the cost and saying, what am I paying a license actually to just in a browser. Andy, it's nice when that happens. But let's, but when we're looking at your graph here, then we still have the techies at the top, the, uh, the people that don't do very much in the middle, and then, um, but the people who like their computers at the bottom. Well, I think it follows very much what we see in, say, the VDI market as well. Is it? It, it really follows the, the guys who are most technical tend to adapt most readily to new types of technology. And, of course, they are suitable for, for moving a di into a different um, technical environment. But when people are relying on certain applications to do their day-to-day -day job or are very much focused on um, being out on the road, being productive and using a system, often those are the most difficult ones to win the hearts and minds of and transition over and get all the apps that they need. Um, so the trick here is to, if you're thinking of actually moving sets of users over from, say, Windows to Linux, is to make sure that you're not just doing change for change's sake. Um, there has to be a valid business reason, so cost or manageability, just as if you're assessing the suitability of VDI, making sure that the application compatibility is there, and then really make sure you do a thorough assessment end-to-end -end before you roll it out and bring them on board to to win the hearts and minds. So Andy, for this, then, there is a strong business case towards simplification. We'll specify one operating system for the entire organization. It might be in the case, in this case, it, it was Linux with the example we were talking about. Most of the time, it's going to end up being Windows. And you have to make a very strong business case to then depart from that because there's cost in managing two operating systems. You will, but it's whenever there is a transition point. So if you are looking at upgrading from XP, for example, that's the time, the natural time to reevaluate whether Windows is the best solution, looking at the applications that are in use and what you need that group of workers to be able to do. So you, you would advocate sort of partitioning, putting in like a you know, box of people over here, they're Linux, box of people over here, they'll stick with Windows. I wouldn't put it that way, but if we look at actually you're transitioning them, you're actually having to do an upgrade, and you look at what they need to do, right. you should evaluate at that point what's the best solution to their needs rather than just going with the default option. Now, for many, Windows is a good migration path because the skills are there, the apps are there, and it's familiarity. Mm -hmm. But just taking the default path isn't always the right or the best path. So it is about making sure that at each stage you keep alternatives in mind because otherwise everything will always be done as it was before. And, in fact, moving to a single OS with a single distribution is almost impossible even in a single Windows environment. Because you've got different patch levels, you've got different apps for different users, you've got to manage these different images, you've got different hardware types. Mm -hmm. So it all becomes quite a complex environment, even if you're just running a, a single vendor OS. So Windows is not just Windows. Windows is often Windows for a specific user group. Boris, you're nodding along with this. I, I, I would have thought you'd be sort of shaking your head and tutting and things like that. As open source communities obviously changed. Uh, no, I completely agree with uh, with the point that have been made, and I think we we we're really seeing that 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 question that question is is it really is Windows really fit? Particularly because when you associate the cost of migration, you don't have just the cost of the upgrade of the operating system, a majority of hardware refresh as well that is triggered with it. 
and as the hardware refresh becomes prevalent across the whole company, when we're talking by thousands, uh, we have effectively costs that people are will, will consider then a second approach and running the dual operating system in-house. Again, uh, the, the mentality of having a single OS for everybody is a cost-cutting measure. It's something that, that I like to challenge very much. Um, the idea is by having a smaller infrastructure that control 100% of each operating system, we can achieve flexibility in cost and a better manageability than trying to put everything under the umbrella of a single management that is falsely not suited to the secondary or best to the two operating systems themselves. So by doing the single umbrella approach, we will end up having a lot of manual maintenance there during that cycle, which of course brings the cost much higher. Uh, than having actually two individual solutions, taking care 100% each of the profiles and the desktop we want to address. Are there, are, there, are there any of these bars here that you think are just too small? Are there any categories where you wish you had more people thinking that you were suitable? Um, absolutely. I think the non-IT technical staff is something that is a reminiscent uh, of, of the perception that people have about desktop Linux. And I think uh, our open clients that is built on target exactly for their usage exactly target that line, the non-IT technical staff, people that will require a web browser, um, a little bit of email, but again, nothing fancy across, nothing spe no specialized application, just doing their work on an everyday basis. And we're talking managers, we're talking non-IT staff, we're talking about uh, project managers even. Um, and that idea is, is to grow that user base using a specialized Linux build desktop and driving cost, essentially. Again, the main motivation across the desktop infrastructure for changing with thing is purely cost. Perhaps I can just go, go back to uh, Andrew's point about you know the, the decision process being people go through deciding between whether they want to use Microsoft and migrate to Linux and the, and the cost associated with it. I think an, an important point to make actually is that it's we help a lot of companies get to the point where they actually can make a decision. So we, we increasingly come across organisations who do not have the luxury of being able to even make a decision because the back-end infrastructure that they've built up and the applications that they've built essentially have locked them in to a, to a single vendor. So whilst, you know, if you actually want to put the, 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 the operating system aside, one of the things which people should go through in terms of decision processing is actually how can I get to the point where I can even think about using a different operating system? That in itself is a very, very interesting uh, thought process to go through. Well, I, I mean, uh, the, next, uh, the next few slides involve, well, they involve the, the politics, but first of all, we need to get to uh, the very basic thing, which we've had some questions about already, which is, you know, app compatibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's now, Andy, on your, on your slide here, the, the, the yellow and the orange, this is kind of don't go there. Don't, don't use Linux for this. Well, this is really looking at how suitable Linux may be and how easy it is to get to a certain type of group of user. So where it's strong is where you've got generic sort of back office functions, where you can just use office type functionality. Uh, you're not really looking at a specific, talking to a specific server and having to interact with it. So being able to get a substitute for Office is fairly easy. You can get Open Office or any number of Star Office, etc., um, to to run on on Linux. Same with web browsers and other areas. And development tools, pretty good. But uh, the other side of things is things like, well, what about your CRM system or your Salesforce, for example, uh, is running SaaS. You can you can if you've got a SaaS model, it's much easier to migrate. But if what you have is a, a specific client that's running only on Windows, it's much more difficult then to interact with your critical line of business. I know it's only once again that you're asking me questions and your answer yeah. is it's not very practical. Well in this case it's how do you go about actually making it usable. It may be that it's it's not the best answer in which case you may continue with Windows for that group of user. The other is to actually start talking to the vendors who supply the applications and put pressure on them to produce open versions that run across Different versions, yeah, different yeah, versions yeah, of the OS. Yeah, you know, it's, you know there, there's not many vendors that you can phone up and say, can you do that for me? And they say, yeah, all right, I'll have it ready for you by Friday. <laughs> and, it, you know, and the other thing is, if you're looking at something like CRM, although it's a specialist application, it goes across a very large part of the business. And does this mean, therefore, that these are not good candidates for your desktop Linux, Paul? It, it may well be that certain applications are not going to be a good candidate for your desktop Linux uh, user. Mm. But uh, as, we, as we mentioned earlier on, increasingly as you see more and more of these critical applications moving to a SaaS-type 
uh, delivery model, whether that be internally or, or externally, then all the uh, end user needs ultimately is access to a browser. Um, and you know, then in, that, in those types of contexts, Linux is an absolutely fantastic fit. Is it the case, being quite direct, that this digs you out of a hole? Because otherwise you'd have hit a roadblock where you basically you'd have run out of people who were willing to take you on. It's, you know, to SAS, get you over a hurdle that otherwise you wouldn't, Boris? Um, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to be very happy for the SaaS model, but the SaaS model brings some other things too. I mean, it, it does really bring a ease of management, even if you were not moving yeah. away from platform. And we're looking really, leg I mean, what I see here in orange and yellow, for me, really represent, I would say, the legacy present into the company. So those legacy applications that, yes... Legacy, they, but important. I they're mean, not critical. They're not critical, don't get me wrong, and this is why they are still running, and this is why they are all on the piece of usually legacy operating system too. Mm. Uh, what the, what the customer needs to realize what the enterprise, the large organization running those applications need to realize is the more they wait, the costly it will be to come to a modern solution. So uh, it is still legacy, even if they are critical. Sure, I'm not saying to take them away, but yes, those companies should look very early into an alternative solution, build it on the side while keeping that, 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 criti that critical application in place until we have 100% of functionality and we can effectively move away from it. Are you saying uh, they should rewrite their applications? So there is a possibility of rewriting the application or simply looking at what existing very easy framework exists to move it away. However, we can look at just simply moving the model from the back end. So, I mean, these are actions, obviously, that we understand are very hard. And this is why I think the message there through this is to say that because of app compatibility and equivalency is so hard, this is not for everyone once again. Mm -hmm. So somebody that does something very the specific big macro in Excel and etc. that are not transportable and that we cannot move or something that represents work from, from many years, for example. No, these are not targets for us. These are not places that we will offer initially a move because, um, again, the methodology behind our transgression to uh, Linux and open client is really the ability to do it in a, in a targeted manner by really addressing a no friction, try me, loss co cost reduction uh, entrance into the operating system. So we're not trying to say, hey, we need to move everything one way to the other and people will have downtime and friction and, and cost down. It's, it's really the reverse approach of targeting first where we can get in without friction. And then at longer term, through the cycle, when the costs effectively are making sense, address that by eventually looking at porting the application or replacing it with a SaaS model. I, I, Andy, I, this um, I, it changes the sort of the spreadsheet when you're making the business case. What we're saying here, doesn't it? Because I mean, Mark's pointed out this that um, software cost is minimal compared to the cost of a migration. And if suddenly we're into a project where you're you're refreshing, rewriting, upgrading, porting software, that's going to dominate the project. It absolutely will, so it has to make sense. But if we look at a number of Windows 7 migrations from XP, application testing, as with everything else, has dominated the migration. Mm -hmm. So moving from Windows to Windows is not a cost-free exercise. So it is about looking at the suitability and the role that's taken. And Linux will not be suitable for all um, applications. And in this case, you've just got to take a pragmatic viewpoint and say, if the pain of transition is too high, we should be continuing with Windows. But where it does make sense, where we've either got SaaS apps or native apps that can do it, and the cost model works for us, and when we can get benefits on manageability or making use of things like old hardware, then it may make absolute sense to, to, to go down the route with, with Linux rather than Windows. But it does come down to individual circumstance and knowing what the benefit is. Change for change's sake is not going to work. No, and what we see from this graph here as well is it, when it comes down to change, then um, the IT staff, they like the change. <laughs> uh, not everybody else likes the change, though. It's still something that's very popular with the techie guys, isn't it? Is this where you go, when you, when you go in to have a conversation, do you still find up talking to the, you know, the IT managers and not in front of the CEO? Absolutely. I mean, so firstly, let me say, I think change, whether it be Lindo, Linux, Linux to Windows or vice versa, you know, people don't like change regardless. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, you know, day to day, our conversations tend to be with IT managers, absolutely no question. But when you start looking at uh, wholesale migration, the really large migrations which we get involved in, then that tends to get pretty senior uh, because that's a, that's a pretty big shift from an organization perspective. Mm. What are we going to do, though, about the fact that end users, generally speaking, don't end up happier? And the business management don't end up happier. Why are you not making them happy? 
Well, I would disagree with that. Um, I think perhaps, you know, if you look at some of the legacy Linux um, migrations which have taken place over years gone by, that, that may well have been the case. But I think that we're a lot wiser now. Linux is a lot more mature in terms of its uh, interface, etc., and it can offer a much, much richer um, uh, experience to users. So I would uh, dis disagree that users aren't, aren't You're happy. saying this represents what people did over the last five, ten years? I, I will tend to agree, yeah, absolutely. I think this is, again, a, a perception that is out there. Um, what we're trying to address there by the use of... by the enormous use of Ubuntu in a community and again the, 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 the ease of use that we brought into the, the Linux operating system and desktop for end user I think the fact that they, they use it at home, they feel very safe with it uh, they get used to it uh, again on a much uh, mainstream user base and this is bringing us automatically into those corporation into those environments where people would like to have something very similar to what they use at home and again uh, that balance as we go forward will shift slightly um, I do think that we do not falsely make end user unhappy. I think there's a lot of guidance that is needed and again we need to realize a couple of things. One of the first things possible is to just keep Windows for example and bring open source application into the context for people to get used to the interface because at the end of the day we are not using an operating system, we use applications. So if I try to make, if I make my user initially very familiar with the application look and feel then switching the base operating system will be just a minor task. I think the main task is really towards application Let's make our user happy with the application. Let's give a little bit of training around it, a little bit of hand-holding to effectively adopt the application and realize the gains there. I, I mean, we, have, we can make a test on this to see whether this actually is a historical thing or whether this, this is still true. Uh, you know, if there's any of you out there that are involved in discussing this at the moment, potentially, or you're involved in a project, let us know whether this graph is um, accurate. Because um, if it is then uh, we'll find out why that is. And if, you know, and, and if it is historical, then they're off the hook. Um, now, let's dig into this a little bit more on some of the, uh, on some of the, the negatives, the potential hurdles, Andy, here. Um, politics at the, top of the, at the top of the chart here. Yeah, it's generally politics and users, and they often intermingle. So mm. it's about making sure that the approach taken is right and that there's buy-in from the people who are going to be using it. Um, as we've said before, if, if there's not really any big change, because in the previous slide we looked at, most respondents were pretty much unsure that there'd be a change in happiness. Mm. Uh, they were neutral as to whether it was better or worse for end users. So it wasn't really that it's worse, it was really neutral. And that means that any change that happens has to really be, be in line with that. So when it comes to politics, it's about making sure that the right people are bought into the project, that it's not seen as being a second-tier option. Who are the example. right people? Um, it will change, but it will be the business leaders. It will actually be the business users. So it's how do you interact and get them on board. Get them on side, to do get so. them positive about it. Yeah, because They don't if, really care, though. If they see that they're getting something else that they perceive as not as good as someone else mm. in, the, in the company, and, for example, when a, a Windows rollout happens, XP to 7, often there's jealousies going around. It's the same type of thing that can happen in a, a Linux rollout. If, it's not, if, if the users aren't brought on board, they don't have buy-in and feel it's, it's their, pro their project mm -hmm. and that it's as good or better than something else, then it, it, it risks failure. I want to look in the middle things for, for you guys, Boris. I want to uh, put this to you. But look, at, um, look at management tools and processes. That's, uh, that's a blocker. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, I, I tend to, for, my, for, for my interaction, again, with, uh, with, with people out there and with the large organization we visit, I will say that the fit with current, man current management tools and processes is the highest hurdle that we're seeing into the adoption. Well, well, I guess once you're in, then some of that politics stuff has been solved. So we're getting down to the nuts and bolts of it. What do we do about that? So there's a, there's a few different approaches there. There's, of course, the approach of integrating with what exists. So we're talking about usually a big directory and big, you know, proprietary mm -hmm. directory that are across the enterprise where we need to hook for authentication, authorization, poli policies, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a possible solution. It has been made possible as well with partner software that do this very well on a specialized point For example? Um, for example, we're talking about likewise. We're talking about um, um, those kind of software that effectively hook into Centrify, that hook into uh, those, those management tool chain. Uh, the problem, again, is this is not a, a level playing field. I mean, we, we, we are 
effectively linking into a third party that can change any time, any day, without preventing us, that doesn't use open standard. And we end up with a solution that becomes a lot of maintenance and very high management, um, and not really bringing that, that advantage of the cost that are it's, it's, mm. it's, it's initially being seen. Um, I think the, the, the right idea is when we build on target, when we really minimize the footprint of the client, and we have only, only what is necessary there, then we find that we're going in a market very similar to the thin client process where we do not need that much management infrastructure either. So authentication, sure, to existing tool chain, that's a good point, but we don't firstly need to have the full control and management policy. That machine is not that computable, is not that desirable as a target, and is really, it becomes a kind of an appliance black box that we're going to switch on and off when something goes wrong. So very similar to the thin client, we're detaching some of the heavyweight management associated with having a full-blown machine, but yet, at the, at the same time, we can just do authentication to have an ease of management of the user at the high point. So I think it's a, it's a crossroad that we're seeing. Where we can have a solution that is good enough again and, and ticks all the box of the, of the business, but yet at the same time doesn't bring us into ever high management solution that become fragile or eventually something that is very costly. So it's... Yeah, so, so Paul, I mean, because of this, I mean, users, uh, reg readers especially, spend years struggling with management and especially with authentication recently. And then they, they, may, they may feel loath to bring in something which, as, you know, as Boris points out, is going to be an imperfect solution quite a lot of the time. Well, as we say, you know, it, it's again you know, fit for purpose. I'm not going to sit here and say that you know, Linux on the desktop is going to be the answer to every, every, you know, uh, the, the solution every single time. Um, it's very much a question of uh, identifying the areas where it works, then making the distribution fit for purpose, as it were, so it does what you need it to do, and then integrating it and creating the environment within which you can actually integrate it. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, one of the big points, as we've already mentioned, is about how do I actually create that infrastructure where I can actually take a third-party operating system into it where I'm not beholden to my single supplier for my operating system software. Uh, Andy, this is a big, suddenly it sounds like to me like a big project. You're having to create a whole new infrastructure just so you can drop Linux into some of it. Well, it would be the same with VDI. VDI has the same type of management and architecture overheads. Well, that's why a lot of people aren't doing it. Absolutely. So this is not right for everyone. But where there are specific circumstances where just running normal Windows is not cost effective, uh, this is a great way to do it. But it does require being able to uh, get that management sorted. And there are a number of tools on the market today that you can invest, that reg readers can invest in, um, that can start to unify some of the management between Windows and Linux. Or choose a best of breed tool that can actually make it happen for that group of users to realize the cost effect efficiencies of deploying Linux. You're very much about the whole flexible IT organization and everything. Are you basically saying this is part of that same project that you've talked about what seems like many times to me now? It does. It's about being being able to be agile. Is that, is that ruder than... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. At all. <laughs> I didn't mean it to be rude. I, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying. I think it's, it's, it's a matter of the scope. First, what kind of organization are we talking to? Are we talking less than 500? Are we talking more than yeah. 500? I mean, over the thousands, let's stop. Again, this will be a radically different solution you can address, depending on that size, depending on that workload. Then the next, the next question come up as being, is that geographically dispersed, or is that all in the same area, and et cetera, et cetera. So all those questions about understanding really the scope of the particular organization, the scope of migration, then as, as Andy was saying, all the... All, whatever is application equivalency and what is the application need of that particular user class, it makes effectively sense to reduce that desktop and to have that flexible approach. And the company wants to become flexible and agile anyway. Otherwise, you get locked again into legacy application, legacy software, and the more we wait and the more it costs, etc. Uh, I mean, there's one thing about this, Andy. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make fun of you like that. <laughs> it's really unfair. So you, you've done all the work, and but w one thing is that the business, as we can see, the business and user influence from your from your pie chart, Mr. Pie Chart, is really quite large now. It is, and it's about drawing them in. Um, the success of IT projects is very much dependent on the acceptance of the end users. So, how do we go about doing this? Well, many companies have no formal review of the performance of IT, for example. So IT just gets on and does what it thinks is best, but doesn't really know what, what the business needs. And it's about how do we hook that up. One way is to get much more interaction with the end user group, for example, and just find out, are they happy with what you're providing? Are mm -hmm. they comfortable with it? So can you put in place survey mechanisms to find out, are they comfortable with the tools? 
are they what, what's the user satisfaction and if we move a step beyond that is can we do things like actually get them in a room together and discuss their problems where they want to go where the business leaders need the company to go and ultimately at the end of the day is is everyone singing from the same, sh same hymn sheet of where the whole company wants to move in terms of sales and strategy and other things and can IT help them to get there so it's it really is a a company-wide initiative, but you can start in small steps by getting an idea of how people feel. Uh -huh. And, and make it, fighting the Linux wars isn't making people feel comfortable, is it? No, I don't think that, that, that helps at all, to be frank. Let's, uh, uh, let's have a look. We can't have a Linux conversation without just giving a couple of minutes to, uh, to legacy hardware, or as I've called it, old kit. Is this still um, a, a rationale for uh, a, adopting desktop Linux? Is you, you've got some old stuff kicking around. Boris, you take this one. Um, yeah, so um, we think it as being a, yeah, a good motivator into the, 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 the people who have approached us, I would say, in the last year. Um, as, as Andy was saying, I mean, moving across Windows to Windows release doesn't entail a cost-free migration again. Sure, process might be more understood and the staff might be more ready for it when it comes to the knowledge itself, uh, but you're gonna, most likely going to have to migrate hardware. Um, it's, it's no secret that the, the legacy proprietary desktop and vendor of this world of operating system are the power with and in hand with the PC manufacturing industry. And after all, you buy a PC every two and three years at home, but why do you really need another PC is the it's question. Like conspiracy usually. theory. No, but, uh, I, no, but, I, no, but I, do, I, I do agree with you because I, I was sitting here when we did a, a, you know, a, a Windows 7 migration, Regcast, and the opinion was voiced around the table that perhaps this is a good time to completely refresh all your PCs as well. And there was some loud scoffing in the comments. Sure. And yeah. I mean, you've got to say that nowadays, any, anybody that has a machine that has a 1.5, 1.6 gigahertz processor of a 2 gig of RAM is actually in possession of a machine that should be able to run any kind of desktop. I mean, especially when we look at light client usage operating system. Yeah, these are capacities that are much more, well enough. Now, if you look into the future, we're going to have coming desktop, light client, coming onto the ARM platform that saves even more money, that, that is even more, less power and degree. And where we're going to need effectively that targeted operating system to exploit the best of the resource on that machine. So what we're seeing in the enterprise world, in a corporate world, is a reduction of the capacity of that client. Because apart being reused at night in grids, um, doesn't really offer such an advantage of having that extra gigahertz and horsepower apart cost of management. I guess you're talking about so like you know once we're freed from thinking about what hardware it takes to run the operating system, then we can use like your tiny little handheld that you've got yeah, that you brought in to show us out there. That's yeah, exactly. the arm powered thing. Yeah, exactly. Big. And it's this big, okay, because it's for another market. But really, the the, the arm platform is coming forward. Uh, we have went forward having a Ubuntu version from arm for now over a year and a half. So we're targeting those devices because they were going to be very low cost, good battery power, can be taken on, really fits the light client approach that we're trying to take and help the customer to keep, I would say, his external device, such as his desktop, his mouse, his keyboard, but simply replace that big tower and get some good money for it on the market and for a third of the cost, replace it with a device on which yeah. any kind of, I would say, refresh or migration of legacy OS will not work. We have, uh, we have seen a, a few organizations now who have essentially said, that actually, we do need to get two or three years more life out of this hardware and, and essentially look to a Linux or an Ubuntu build to actually extend the life of their, of the, of their hardware. And these, these haven't been small organizations. You know, when you're talking about tens of thousands of desktops, you can, you know, you can save a considerable amount of money by squeezing an extra year or two out of, uh, out of your hardware. I, it, it does link into a, the negative user image though doesn't it rather than getting a new pc that they were expecting they get their old one cleaned up and look we put linux on it for you and it's like oh you know two cheers you know. well again a lot of the users don't even know that it's linux they don't care that that, it, that it's linux and again it, it comes back to the classic thing fit fit for purpose you know if i'm sitting there doing you know a a, a certain number of tasks and it works seamlessly and, it, and it's fast mm -hmm. you know i shouldn't really care whether i have a the, the Later, shiny Intel processor sitting beneath my desk, or, or, or not? Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that um, the, there's still a lot in the story on reusing legacy kit? This, what, or, you know, what we used to call doing more with less for about eighteen months. Well, it's what the Reg readership tell us they do all the time. Yep. Is they they tend to refresh at the high end. They have a lot of kit left over, and you can either redeploy with existing OS, and it may be over time that that becomes too slow to be practical. In which case, can you? 
deploy a Linux version that's targeted, that's cut down in terms of features, but is optimized to make it run with good performance, in which case it's a good solution. But if all that you're trying to do is actually put in a generic solution that runs badly, but happens to be Linux, then there's unlikely to be a good user acceptance, just as it would be if it was, say, a Windows box that didn't have good performance. Briefly challenged what we're saying here. Um, that the, uh, the cost of supporting legacy computers is huge, says Mark. Um, but Windows 7 has lower needs than Vista, so it's not necessarily um, a, an operating system-driven upgrade. It's about supporting the hardware, which is all dirty and horrible inside. Um, I, I like to address that and to say that first, uh, many, many organizations skipped Vista. So I effectively come so in. So the Vista is a bit of a straw man on this mm, one. Yeah, no, okay. no more mention okay, on that. <laughs> yeah. But I would simply say that, yeah, they're coming most likely from XP hardware, and moving to Win 7 will require a hardware refresh. And you're cool with an XP hardware style platform, you can get something going on that. Absolutely. And just to address your previous point about saying it's second best, so it looks like I've been having a machine refurbished and slap something else on it. I think there is a lot of way to make it attractive. There's a lot of way to, to, to change that perception and show the benefit again. So that that, that, that is really a part of the training, a part of the showing people what they have as a tool rather than throwing it there without explanation. Okay. And we mustn't forget, of course, that where we're actually pushing these down into a new user group, they're probably running on a machine that's seven or eight years old, moving to a three or four-year-old machine. Mm -hmm. So they're still getting a step up in many cases. <laughs> so it's about being fit for purpose again. It's a disappointing <laughs> life at work sometimes. <laughs> <It's handy. laughs> okay, let's uh, let's look into some of the practicalities of this. Uh, this sort of uh, licorice all sorts diagram um, is uh, you guys at Canonical brought out these particular stages here. But what do they mean in real life? What is a realistic target, Paul? Well, I think uh, you need to understand why you're doing this. Essentially, you know, what do you want out of, uh, out of this exercise? Is it increased flexibility? Is it increased security? Is it reduced costs? In, in many of those things, it's actually you know, all of these types of components. But before you embark on this type of uh, project, you really need to understand exactly what you're getting out of it. It's just, it's just best practice, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, the professional expertise... What professional expertise? Which professionals do we want? Well, I mean, there's, you know, Linux, there's been a lot of said about Linux on the desktop, and this year is the, 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 the year when Linux will break through on the, on the, on the desktop. Um, and, you know, th those sort of discussions haven't really helped the adoption. Uh, but now I think you're starting to see large-scale organizations bet their future on Linux on the, on the desktop. There's you know, an awful lot of large-scale adoptions going on there. But people who get involved in this because it's so mission critical, you need to involve the experts. You need to involve people who have done it before and who know what they're trying to do it yourself. If you think you've got the experts in-house, that's the beauty of open source, then try and do it yourself. But you have to, again, be honest and upfront with yourself as an organization and say, do I have the expertise to do this? Mm. And uh, I will complement by saying the get the professional expert expertise is really an advice. It's really an advice from vendors, from people who have already done it, from similar organizations that have done again through, that have gone through this. It's yeah. about sharing that knowledge. It's about really, uh, you know, understanding the big black point from a start rather than falling into an easy trap. So I think that's it's particularly important when you look at that setting realistic target gets along with professional expertise just to start to understand what are my users doing on the desktop. Uh, with a, again, with a small deployment with 500 less of desktop, it is quite easy to do. But when we span over the 20 or thousands of, of desktop, it's very hard to understand what is everybody profile and what do they really need. And often we'll see by that unique approach of one operating system, companies haven't actually targeted those into profile. Yeah. So that's really one of the, the, the helping hand that the professional expertise can do is to really help them to, to partition those users and understand the needs for each categories of those users. And it's partitioning those users, looking lower down the stack, the minimizing deployment risk. It's the thing. You're not. Are you suggesting that we go sort of very gently on this if you haven't Absolutely. if you haven't got desktop Linux Absolutely. or Linux already? So, so the most successful migrations that we've always seen are where organisations take a step by step approach. That they roll it out slowly and surely. They, they learn from each of those experiences, and you know make the associated changes as and when they learn f from that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. And, and Andy, you you in tune with all of this? We're mostly in tune with all of it, but what we'd say as well is actually make sure that you do your due diligence. Don't just believe what you, what's being told to you, but go out, speak to peers in the industry, get references, go and speak to them and see it in action, mm. and make sure that you're comfortable that what's, what it says on the tin is actually what can be delivered. 
You're okay with that, are you? I mean, we mentioned one customer. Are there others that you'd be able to reference abs for abs this? Absolutely. I mean, people are no longer, you know, you're not unique now in terms of taking on large-scale Linux mm -hmm. desktops. So there's plenty, plenty of experience out there and plenty of references out there for people to uh, learn more from. Yeah. And I would say another point what we find very interesting is those customers as well in the field have been involved have been putting back that knowledge into circulation, in, into the community. And the more people will do this, the easier it will be for the next proponents to come because they will learn from, they will have the lesson learned tag of all, those, all that information out there. Does that still flourish? I was talking to some people in um, one of the other distribution vendors and they're the same we're basically we're, you know we're very much more like microsoft these days people tend to you know buy it do it keep that for themselves competitive advantage so good it's a great question so you you come to us after um, monday today last week uh, we had about 550 developers um, at the ubuntu developer summit um, these were people from all around the world representing some of the biggest companies in the world essentially talking about the next release of ubuntu um, so the community absolutely flourishes around the, uh, the you know, l Linux. In, so you're, in you're still of the old school. I, I absolutely, still of, still of the old school. I think I think the Ubuntu community has, has has made the old school not so much old school, I would say. And, yeah, and exactly. that, that gathering of people that is a mix of customers, of developers, channel partner, as well as the end user in mass. And when everybody mix and and, and understand, we have different requirements, but yet can develop the operating system to go and meet all of those requirements to a certain extent. So it's not about, um, I would say, it's not about trying to do everything at the same time, but really understanding what is the request of the different group and, and using them really to a better advantage to serve better the customers. So I would say, to that extent, Canonical has the experience they receive from interacting with all those different groups, and that's where we can help, I would say, further towards the, the, get, the get professional ex and ex expertise and minimalizing the deployment risk. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, what's this one at the bottom? F future proofing your desktops. What's that? So um, I, I'll take this one because this is, I think, really the most important part just before getting enterprise support. What enterprise support will do is not just simply pick up the phone and answer you when you have a problem and when you have uh, 20 or thousands of people running a desktop like this, you will have your internal organization that will pre-step this. So uh, we will just be there as a part of an escalation, but this about, it's about giving proactive support. So instead of having your own IT staff qualifying the next upgrade, the next client, does I work with that application, does I work with that new hardware, no, we're talking about having somebody in Canonical that represents you in a proactive manner, not only for those development summits and as well keeping the features you want, but as well, well... Look out for what they know is coming along for you. Exactly, having you on hardware internally, qualifying your upgrade, qualifying your image, making sure it works for you, so simplifying a lot of the rollout of future upgrade and it, taking a lot of the work that we have locally onto How the that IT work? staff. That sounds quite intensive. Um, it's not that intensive because if you look at the ID, what enterprise will do is they will freeze the repository so they will have a certain set of version and software running at a certain time. So as long as we prevail this and pre-qualify that in advance for the customer, this is the part of the service we receive and that will be that will be the, 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 the engineer will address the customer by simply saying that particular version at that date has been qualified on your hardware and works, works properly. So we know the next step of deployment of that update is absolutely possible. It is a pre-qualification effectively to feature-proof the, the upgrade. Got it. Okay. Uh, uh, Andy, this is just what Red Read has passed back as, uh, as tips here. And you see there near the top um, the, the app compatibility. It's definitely something that people have learned about from experience. Absolutely. If you don't have the features and functions that the business users want, they will quickly find other ways to do things or reject the solution. Mm -hmm. So it's about not trying to push a solution that's not suitable onto them purely for things like cost reasons, mm -hmm. but realizing that actually workers are productive, their salaries are expensive, they've got to be able to do what they want to do. And it's about also getting their buy-in and making sure that we're considering what it is that they want to do with their PCs. So in, in taking things slowly, just finding somewhere where... The, the apps aren't going to cause a problem, so there's a, there's a least resistance there. Yeah, and it's making sure that um, where there are shortfalls, that it's made up, for example, in SaaS applications if we can't find the native applications, and longer term, trying to get a bigger pool of native applications so that it is more broadly applicable. But don't try and force change for change's sake or something that's not suitable purely for some element of cost where there's a bigger picture at stake. Lovely. I'm just going to I'm just going to click onto our, our last slide because I want to give you a chance to talk about OSALT down here, uh, Boris. Because I know that's something that you're uh, that you're 
keen about? Yeah, um, I think Osalt, uh, who stands for open source as an alternative, Osalt.com, um, is a good website, a great website for you to find uh, already to start to study the equivalency of your application moving from a Windows environment or proprietary environment towards um, open if cloud. If you want to find an open source application that does the thing that you Exa exactly does. Exactly correct. I think the, the color code are quite simple as well. Whatever is green is green is actually an open source application. Whatever is red is a proprietary application. So uh, it's pretty easy to see the, 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 the report there. And I will engage as well people with no further application to participate to the side uh, to, to complement that base of knowledge. But it's usually a very good reference point for people looking at first the application equivalency, which should be the first step again. Yeah, now we've just got a, a, ooh, about one minute left, so we've got a couple of quick questions. Let's try and deal with these, get them out of the way. Um, running, deploying, and managing Linux on the desktop is difficult, uh, different to a laptop or a mobile device? Essentially, no. You have to deal with VPN, wireless, and these kind of things that are get ready if you want to give the user uh, access externally uh, to the network. Uh, so this will, will be more, I would say, in a, in a back end, a little bit more management uh, that will done really on the client. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying enterprises using Wine to avoid um, the rebuild with Microsoft apps? No. 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 I mean, generally, licensing issues on the whole. Exactly that. You, you, you still have the licensing issues with Wine, which obviously we need to respect. Um, so why as an enterprise would I need to want to pay twice, essentially? Don't go there. Um, and uh, that's about time. all we've got time for. We've got one or two more. we sort of run out of time. We've answered about 80% of 80% of the questions. It's a bit like one of Andy's charts. And, <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of questions, has many parts to it. So I hope that we've, uh, that we've covered that. Um, they had a lot of stuff. If we haven't, I'll make sure that the guys say, Boris, you're keen. You can do all of this. And, <laughs> thank uh, you. Yeah. But, uh, Paul and Boris, thank you very much for coming to the studio. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you. And um, Andy Buss, thank you as ever. A pleasure. Mr. Bychart, you covered yourself in glory today. Uh, I did not. I was very rude to all of our guests. So I'd like to apologize to them. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our RegCast. However, give us your feedback. Tell us more of what you like. If you like some more of these, then it's good. It's, it's nice to do Linux for, for a change, actually. It's, it's like holiday. It's terrific. And, um, but please join us for our next RegCast. I've been Tim Phillips. Goodbye.